Hello Calc 3 and welcome back to the second half of section 16.2. Uh, in this section we'll be covering the notion of work, circulation, and flux. So in the last video we discussed how to calculate the line integral of a vector field over a curve in space. And in this video, we will look at applications of these line integrals, hopefully giving some justification for why we would define them in the first place. So there are three different applications which are listed in the title here. We have work, that'll be the first application. Then we'll talk about circulation. And then finally, we'll talk about flux. So let's start out with work. Um, we can use a line integral to give us the work done by a force over a curve in space. So let's let F be a vector field given by M of XYZ I plus N of XYZ J plus P of XYZ K. And this vector field will represent a force throughout a region in space. So this is one of the instances uh, in which we can use a vector field to describe something uh, in the real world that was given in the last video. And then let C be a smooth curve given by r of t is equal to g of t i plus h of t j plus k of t k. So r of t is just a parameterization of that curve where t is ranging from a to b. Then uh, we can define the work done by a continuous force field or just a vector field that's giving force f to move an object along c, the curve, from a point a to a point b as follows. So in the following discussion, we will, uh, we will basically build up or derive the formula uh, for work over a curve that's running through a vector field. <clears throat> so uh, we have our curve C that's going through space or through the plane. Uh, and you can refer to the diagram as I'm going through a bunch of this stuff here. So we can start off by dividing our curve C into N sub arcs. So we pick points along the curve uh, and we're dividing the curve into the intervals between those points. So we will denote those sub arcs as P sub K minus one P sub K. So it's the arc between the K minus one point and the Kth point. And each of these sub arcs is going to have a length delta S sub K um, and again, we're starting at A along the curve C and ending at B. So now we want to let X sub K, Y sub K, Z sub K be a point in each of these sub arcs that we've just created. And we can let T of X sub K, Y sub K, Z sub K be the unit tangent vector at the chosen point. So maybe I should put a little vector symbol above T there. Then the work W sub K done to move the object along each of the sub arcs p sub k minus one to p sub k is approximated by the tangential component of the force which is given by our vector field f of x sub k y sub k z sub k times the arc length delta s sub k that approximates the distance the object moves along the sub arc so again we have the tangential component of the force f um, at our point x sub k y sub k z sub k and then we're multiplying that by the arc length delta s sub k of our particular sub arc then the total work done over c so up above was an approximation for the work uh, over one of the sub arcs now we're talking about the total work that's done over the curve c from the point a to b is approximated by the sum from k equals one to n of each of these w sub k's. And I remember that each of these w sub k's is given as the dot product of f of x sub k, y sub k, z sub k, and t of x sub k, y sub k, z sub k. Um, as I said it above, I said that uh, the work is approximated by the tangential component of the force f of x sub k, y sub k, z sub k. But that tangential component is going to be given by the dot product of f and t at that point, at that kth point. And then again, we're multiplying by the arc length of that sub arc, so delta s sub k. 
and the exact work, w, is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of these sums that we've now defined above. So ultimately, the work done by a force field over some curve and moving an object is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of these sums that we've now created above, and we can write that as the integral of the vector field f over the curve c. So this line integral that we define in the first half of section 16.2 uh, in the case that the vector field is, is describing a force exerted by some object onto another object in space, uh, this line integral is going to define the work done by that object in moving um, another object in space. Or the work done by the force field, maybe I should say, instead of the object exerting the force. Okay, and this leads to our first definition here. So let C be a smooth curve parametrized by R of T, where T is ranging from A to B, and let F be a continuous force field over a region that contains the curve C. Then the work done in moving an object from point A to point B along the curve C is given by W equals the line integral of the vector field F over the curve C, which we said in the last video is equal to uh, the ordinary integral from A to B of f of r of t dot dr dt dt. So again, we can write this line integral of the vector field over the curve C as an ordinary, as an ordinary integral uh, in terms of the parameter t. So we can, this is just a note here uh, for you to be aware of. We can write this work integral in multiple ways. So even in the last section, um, I wrote down the line integral for a vector field over some curve in a bunch of different ways. And here the book just listed basically all of the ways that this um, line integral can be written. And so I have those different ways here. Uh, we have the definition of the line integral. That's one way to write it. We could also write it as uh, the integral of f dot dr over c. This is called the vector differential form. We could also write it as f dot dr dt dt, uh, just the ordinary integral from a to b. Uh, they call this the parametric vector evaluation. Um, and then there are two other ways down here. I'm not even going to mention this parametric scalar evaluation. I will mention the scalar differential form because I think this is a pretty common form to see the integral written in. Here we have the integral of m dx plus n dy plus p dz over c. So again, all of these uh, different ways to write the integral are equivalent to one another, um, but you might see different, uh, different ways to notate it uh, at different times, especially in the homework, or maybe if I choose to write it in different ways on the exam, I just want you to be aware of them. So then let's move down to our first example where we actually calculate the work done by a force field along a curve. So um, the vector field is given by y minus x squared i plus z minus y squared j plus x minus z squared k. And we wanna find the work done by that vector field along the curve r of t is equal to ti plus t squared j plus t cubed k. Uh, where t is ranging from 0 to 1, from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. So this is our point A, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1 is our point B. So notice that our parametrization evaluated at 0 is equal to the point A, 0, 0, 0, and the parametrization evaluated at 1 is equal to point B, 1, 1, 1. So, uh, based on the discussion above, the definition that we have for work, we know that work is equal to uh, the integral from A to B of f of r of t dot dr dt uh, dt. So to, uh, to evaluate this integral, we need to find expressions for x, y, and z in terms of t, and then also find dr dt. So over our curve C, x is going to equal t, that's coming from the first component of our parameterization r of t, 
y is going to equal t squared, coming from the second component of our parameterization, and z is going to equal t cubed, coming from the third component of our parameterization. And after we know this, uh, then we can write f of r of t by taking each of these functions, giving x, y, and z, and plugging them in for the vector field that's given in the problem up here. So the ith component is going to be t squared minus t squared. The j component is going to be t cubed minus t to the fourth. And the k component is going to be t minus t to the sixth. Again, you can verify that each of these components is correct by taking the functions, giving x, y, and z that we have here, and plugging them in for x, y, and z in our uh, original vector field. After we've done this, then we can take the derivative of the parameterization r with respect to t, and we find that dr dt is equal to i plus 2tj plus 3t squared k. And finally, we can use all of this information and plug it back in for the expression for work that we have right here. So the work done by the vector field f over the curve r of t is given by the ordinary integral from 0 to 1 of t cubed minus t to the fourth j plus t minus t to the sixth k. So this is f of r of t dot i plus 2tj plus 3t squared k. This is dr dt, and then we're integrating with respect to the variable t. So we take the dot product, uh, and we get 2t times t cubed minus t to the fourth plus 3t squared times t minus t to the sixth uh, dt. And then again, we do a little bit of algebra. We get 2 times t to the fourth minus 2t to the fifth plus 3t cubed minus 3t to the eighth. And then finally, we can take the antiderivative of that. We get 2 fifths times t to the five minus 2 sixths times t to the six plus 3 fourths times t to the four minus 3 ninth times t to the 9. And we're evaluating from 0 to 1. So if we plug in 1, we get 2 fifths minus 2 sixths plus 3 fourths minus 3 ninths. And ultimately, that will evaluate to 29 over 60. So uh, at the end of the day here, the work that's done by our force field given by f along the curve parameterized by r of t from the point 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1 is going to be equal to 29 over 60. So this is a powerful application of calculus here. Um, in a basic introductory physics course, you might learn how to find or how to calculate work um, when you're moving an object in a particular direction when, uh, when the force is staying constant. But here we just found the work done by a force that is variable over uh, a relatively complex curve that we had to parameterize. So this is a really nice generalization of the concept of work from an elementary physics course um, that is certainly more applicable to real life physics problems. Okay, so now let's move on to the second application. Um, for both the second and the third application, we're going to be talking about vector fields that represent velocity vectors at different points as opposed to uh, force vectors at different points. And in particular, you can think about them um, as, or you can think about the vector fields as representing the velocity of a fluid inside of a region at different points. Uh, and fluid dynamics is a notoriously difficult uh, subject inside of physics but we'll just kind of brush the surface here with some fluid dynamics and maybe an application of the line integral over a vector field for fluid dynamics. So again, suppose now that our vector field F represents the velocity field of a fluid that's flowing through a region in space or the plane. Uh, in these circumstances, the integral of F dot T along a curve in the region gives the fluids flow along or circulation around the curve. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. What do I mean by the fluids flow along a curve or the circulation around a curve? Um, but let's start off with the definition here. 
So if R of t parametrizes a smooth curve C that's in the domain of our velocity field F, the flow along the curve from A, uh, which is given by R of A at the beginning of our parametrization, to B, which is given by R of B, is uh, represented as the integral or the line integral of our vector field F over the curve C. And this integral is called a flow integral. And if the curve starts and ends at the same point, so that the point A is equal to the point B, then the flow is called the circulation around the curve. So the circulation is just a particular instance of the flow uh, when the curve that we're talking about is a closed loop. And if you don't know what a closed loop is, again, I'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. So note that for all of the applications that we've talked about, both the application for work uh, as well as the application to flow now, the direction that we traverse our curve C does matter. So if we switch the direction in which we traverse the curve, then the sign of the integral is going to change. And so do keep that in mind. Um, for example, if, if the force field, um, if we're talking about the force field uh, applying some kind of work or performing some kind of work to some object as it moves through space along a curve, uh, depending on the direction we traverse that curve, the work is either going to be positive or negative. And so the way that we traverse the curve is going to matter in that case. And we'll see that it also matters in this case here. Okay, so let's move on to an example where we're calculating some flow. Um, so let's find the circulation of the field F equals X minus Y I plus X times J around the circle that is parametrized as cosine ti plus sine tj, where t is ranging from 0 to 2 pi. So we can interpret the circulation over the curve inside of the plane here as how much the fluid is swirling in the direction of our curve. So in this case, we are traversing the curve counterclockwise. So we're going this direction. And if you look at the vector field, um, again, I took this diagram from the book, if you look at the vector field, you can see that as we're moving along the curve inside of the vector field, the vector field is kind of moving in the same direction. And when that's the case, um, we would expect the circulation around that curve to be positive. If I were to traverse the curve in this direction, so let's assume that I'm going clockwise now, Notice how as I go around the curve, I'm going against the flow of the vectors in the vector field. When this kind of phenomenon happens, we can expect the flow integral to be negative. And so the flow integral ultimately gives us a way to quantify uh, how much our traversing the curve is kind of going in the direction of the vector field at the different points on the curve. Um, okay, so the circulation will be given by the integral, just the ordinary integral from A to B of F of R of T dot dr dt with respect to T. So this is just by definition that's been given up here. So again, the first step in calculating this integral is writing X and Y uh, in terms of T and then calculating dr dt as the second step. So along the curve C, x is going to be equal to cosine of t, since that's the i component for our parametrization, and y is going to equal sine of t, since that's the j component for our parametrization. And then if we substitute x and y with their functions in t, uh, we find that f of r of t is equal to cosine t minus sine t i plus cosine t j. So this is taking um, x and t given in this original equation for the vector field, and it's replacing, um, or I should say x and y given in the equation for the vector field, and it's replacing them with their corresponding functions in t. So we have cosine t minus sine t for i, and then cosine t for j. 
And the second step now is calculating the, uh, the derivative of r with respect to t. So r is given by cosine t i plus sine t j. If we take the derivative, then we get negative sine t i plus cosine t j. And uh, a is equal to zero and b is equal to two pi in this integral here, since we're parametrizing uh, the curve from zero to two pi. So finally, the circulation is going to equal the integral from zero to two pi of cosine t minus sine t i plus cosine t j dot minus sine t i plus cosine t j. Uh, and of course, we're taking the integral with respect to t here. So if we calculate that dot product, we get minus sine t cosine t plus sine squared t plus cosine squared t. And uh, the sine squared t plus cosine squared t is just going to give us a one. And so we're left with a one minus sine t cosine t dt. We can split that up into two integrals. So first we just have the integral from zero to two pi of dt minus the integral from zero to two pi of sine of t cosine of t dt. Uh, and a little bit of a u substitution here, uh, letting u equal sine of t will allow us to evaluate that integral. Uh, and we get t evaluated from zero to two pi minus sine squared of t over two evaluated from zero to two pi. Um, and the first part is going to give us two pi and the second part is going to give us zero since sine of two pi is equal to zero and sine of zero is equal to zero. So we find that the circulation is going to be equal to two pi. And as I already said before, since the fluid is circulating counterclockwise around the circle, if we look up in the diagram here, you can see that the fluid is flowing in the direction that we're traversing our curve. And because that is the case, the circulation is going to be positive. If the fluid was uh, flowing in the opposite direction of our curve, then we would expect uh, that integral to be negative. So the circulation and, and the flow more generally give us a way to quantify uh, the direction that the fluid is generally flowing along some kind of curve that we draw in the plane. Okay, now we move on to the last example, um, the last application for the line integral over a vector field that we will cover in this section. Uh, and that last example is going to be flux across a simple closed plane curve. So first off, we should probably note, what do I mean by a simple closed curve? So a curve in the plane is simple if it doesn't cross itself. So uh, this would be an example of a curve that is not simple because it crosses itself in the middle. While this would be an example of a curve that is, uh, that is simple because it doesn't cross itself. This would also be an example of a simple curve. A curve is closed if it starts and ends at the same point. So this example that I've drawn here would be an example of a simple closed curve, while this example is just a simple curve that is not closed. And this might be a closed curve uh, that is not simple. So when we proceed with our discussion here for flux, we are talking about simple closed curves. Um, and we might also call them uh, loops. So they're things that generally look like this, just kind of funky circles. That's the idea. So to find the rate at which a fluid is entering or leaving a region enclosed by a simple closed curve C in the plane, we can calculate the line integral over the curve C of the dot product of F and N, lowercase n. And we haven't seen this lowercase n before, um, but that lowercase n denotes uh, the outward pointing normal vector of the curve at different points here. So F dot n is going to be the scalar component of the fluid's velocity in the direction of the curve's outward pointing normal vector. 
and the value of this line integral over the curve C of f dot n is defined to be the flux of f across C. Uh, and intuitively, we're talking about the velocity or the rate at which a fluid is entering or leaving that region that's enclosed by the curve. So this leads down to a rigorous definition. If C is a smooth, simple, closed curve in the domain of a continuous vector field, F, which is given by M of X, Y, I plus N of X, Y, J in the plane. So notice here that we're talking specifically about vector fields in the plane and curves in the plane. We're not talking about uh, three-dimensional objects here. And if N is the outward pointing normal vector on the curve C, then the flux of our vector field F across the curve C is given by uh, the line integral of F dot N over the curve C. So notice here that we are integrating F dot N and we are not integrating F dot T. So in both of the applications previous to this application, we've talked about the integral of f dot the unit tangent vector. Now we're talking about f dot the unit normal vector, and specifically the unit normal vector that points outward from the curve. So to calculate flux, we begin with a smooth parametrization of the curve that's given to us. So we'll be given some curve C that goes through the plane. Um, so we let x equal g of t and we let y equal h of t. Uh, depending on that parametrization, where t is ranging from a to b, which again will be given by the parametrization. We can find the unit normal vector um, by finding t cross k, but we need to make sure that n points outward. So in the diagrams that we have down here, you can see that we have our curve c given in blue, uh, we also have the unit tangent vector in yellow represented by T, uh, and then we have K, and by K, I just mean the standard unit vector in the Z direction. And if we take K cross T, or if we take T cross K, so in either of these cases, we're going to get a vector um, that is perpendicular to the curve. But the question is, is t cross k or is k cross t going to give me a normal vector that points outward from the curve? Because in one direction, I'm going to get a normal, a normal vector that points inward, and in the other direction, I'm going to get a normal vector that points outward. And we want to make sure that n points outward and not inward. So if we traverse c in the counterclockwise direction, then n is going to equal t cross k. So that's going to give us the normal vector pointing outwards. If we traverse C in the clockwise direction, then N is going to be equal to K cross T. So notice how the, um, how the order for the cross product here changes depending on whether we're traversing C in the counterclockwise direction or the clockwise direction. Um, but it's normal for us to traverse in the counterclockwise direction. So in the following derivation, we assume that we're traversing the curve C in the counterclockwise direction. So this is the standard direction to traverse a curve. And in that case, the normal vector is going to equal T cross K, which we just discussed. So T is given by dx ds as the I component plus dy ds as the J component. So this is just the definition of the unit tangent vector. And we're taking the cross product of this vector here with the standard unit vector K in the Z direction. And you can do this math yourself if you want to, but when we take that cross product, we get dy ds i minus dx ds j. And then if we have our vector field is equal to m of x, y, i, plus n of x, y, j, we have that the dot product of f and n is equal to m of x, y times dy, ds. So we're taking this i component of the unit normal vector here, 
uh, and we're taking this i component of f and we're multiplying them together minus n of xy times dx ds. So here we've taken the j component from the unit normal vector and multiplied it by the j component of f. So the line integral of f dot n over the curve c is equal to the line integral of m times dy ds minus n times dx ds over c. And now we have a ds out here and we have some ds's in here uh, and we can multiply and we find that this is equal to the line integral of m dy minus n times dx over the curve c and notice that here we have this circle that's being drawn on the integral and we put a we put an arrow on it going in the counterclockwise direction um, to notate that here we are integrating with a parameterization of our curve C that goes in the counterclockwise direction. So to evaluate, we express m, dy, n, and dx in terms of t, and then integrate from t equals a to t equals b. So ultimately, this expression here, this m, dy minus n, dx, is going to be the definition for um, for the flux of f across some closed curve in the plane. But to actually evaluate that integral, uh, we're going to do the same thing that we've done for all of the other line integrals, which is we take each of those variables, m, dy, n, and dx, and we write them in terms of t, and then we integrate using just an ordinary integral from calc 1 and calc 2 uh, with respect to the variable t. So here's our formal uh, definition here, flux across a smooth closed plane curve is defined to be um, the integral of m dy minus n dx over the curve c traversed in the counterclockwise direction. And again, we just want to make sure that when we're given this curve c in the plane that we parameterize it first off in the counterclockwise direction so that we can actually use this definition here. And then uh, secondly, we want to make sure that we're only traversing the curve once when we parameterize it. So if we're given the cir a circle in the plane, for example, um, and we use the parameterization r of t is equal to cosine t i plus sine of t j, we want to make sure that um, we say that t is going from 0 to 2 pi. Because if we said that t was going to 0, or from zero to four pi, for example, then we would be traversing the curve twice, even though we're going in the counterclockwise direction. And we wanna make sure that we only traverse a curve once when we perform this integral. So this moves us down to our last example now. So we wanna find the flux of the vector field f equals x minus y i plus x j across the circle x squared plus y squared is equal to one in the x y plane. So note, first of all, um, that the vector field given here, as well as the curve in the plane, x squared plus y squared equals one. Um, this, th this is the vector field and the curve that was given in the previous example. So if we go up here, um, we already have a diagram of this given here. And again, this flux is going to tell us the rate at which fluid is entering or exiting um, that circle that we have drawn in the plane. So uh, the parameterization for C given by R of T is equal to cosine T I plus sine T J, where T goes from zero to two pi, is going to trace out that circle X squared plus Y squared equals one exactly once in the counterclockwise direction. So if we have our circle in the plane here, this parameterization traces out that circle starting from here and moving this direction and it stops when it gets back to that original point since t is only going from 0 to 2 pi. So as we discussed above, the flux of, uh, of f going across this or the region bounded by the curve c is given by the integral from a to b of m dy minus n dx. 
and x is going to equal cosine of t. So x is going to be equal to this i component of the parameterization. y is equal to the j component of the parameterization, which will be sine of t. Uh, and this is the case along the curve c. And after we have this information, uh, then we can find m of r of t. So m is just equal to, let's see, m is equal to x minus y because it's the i component of the vector field. Uh, so when we plug in the functions in t for x and y, we get m of r of t is equal to cosine t minus sine t. And then n of r of t, well, n is given as x. So when we plug in um, the function in t for x, we just get that n of r of t is equal to cosine t. And now we can take the, uh, we can find dx and dy in terms of t as well. So dx dt is going to be equal to minus sine t, which implies that dx is equal to minus sine t dt. And dy dt is the derivative of sine t, uh, which will be cosine t, which implies that dy is equal to cosine t dt. And at this point, we can finally set up our integral and solve for flux here. So the flux of our vector field F across the curve C is equal to the integral from zero to two pi of cosine T minus sine T times cosine T minus cosine T times minus sine T dt. So here we've just taken the expressions for M of RT or M of R of T and N of R of T and we've replaced them for M and N inside of uh, this formula here. And then we've taken the expressions for dx and dy, and we've also substituted them into that equation. And then at this point, it really just reduces to a problem from calc one and calc two. So we're just evaluating an ordinary integral now. Um, doing a little bit of algebra, we get cosine squared t minus sine t cosine t plus cosine t sine t. Um, and again, we're taking the integral from zero to two pi. Um, the minus sine t cosine t and the positive cosine t sine t are going to cancel with one another. And so we're just left with the integral from zero to two pi of cosine squared t dt. And uh, using a little bit of a trig identity here, we get that this is equal to the integral from zero to two pi of one plus cosine of two t divided by two dt. Uh, we can split that into two integrals here. And ultimately we get uh, one half t evaluated from zero to two pi plus one fourth sine of two t evaluated from zero to two pi. Uh, and this second part is just going to go to zero because sine of four pi is equal to zero and sine of zero is equal to zero. And so we're just left with whatever we get when we evaluate the first part and we end up getting pi. So because our answer is positive, this means that the net flow across C is outward. So C is our curve in, uh, in the plane like this, and we have our vector field that's going in all kinds of directions around it like this. And the fact that when we integrated um, over this curve C to calculate flux, the fact that our answer was positive means that there is fluid that's leaving this circle in this direction as time goes on. So the rate at which fluid is leaving is positive. If instead um, the vector field looks something more like this, maybe things were kind of angled inward towards the circle, then we would expect the value of our integral here to be negative because the rate at which fluid is leaving the circle is going to be negative implying that the rate at which fluid is entering the circle is, uh, is positive. So again, the value of this integral here, its, uh, its interpretation to the real world has to do with how much fluid is entering or leaving some region that we trace out with a curve inside of the plane. Okay, so hopefully the information in this video was valuable. I know that it was long. Um, and email me with any questions that you have about the homework. You should be 
uh, prepared at this point to answer all of the questions that I've assigned for section 16.2. Uh, and I'll be uploading section 16.3 sometime tomorrow, I think. So look out for that.